All right, good evening, everyone. Hi, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali, and I'm the events coordinator here at Books and Magic. Before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's gonna go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on, covering both your nose and mouth at all times while at this event. Uh, we handed out no cards, as I mentioned previously, while you checked in, and we will be collecting those soon. So if you've got a question, please write it down now. After the talk tonight, Sarah will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door behind me. We also have additional books available for purchase tonight at the desk where you checked in. And if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of All This Could Be Different online using the link in the live stream, in the live stream description. So with all that in mind, we are very excited to introduce Sarah Thinka Matthews and C. Pam Zhang, who are here celebrating the release of Sarah's debut novel, All This Could Be Different. <laughs> This novel is filled to the with emotion, compassion, friendships, and losses. The story introduces us to Sneha, a first-generation immigrant from India, as she moves to Milwaukee for an entry-level corporate job. What follows is an incredible coming-of-age story of struggling through a recession, creating intimate bonds and lasting friendships, finding queer love, overcoming family trauma, all told through wickedly sharp narration. This novel completely broke me, as I'm sure it did many of you out in the audience, and then carefully, lovingly pieced me back together. So, of course, we all can't wait to hear what more Sarah has to say about it tonight. Sarah Thinka Matthews grew up between Oman and India, immigrating to the United States at 17. Her work has been published in Best American Short Stories, and she is a recipient of fellowships from the Asian American Writers Workshop and the Iowa Writers Workshop. In 2020, she founded the, the mutual aid group Beds Die Strong. And as I mentioned before, C. Pam Zhang joined Sarah in conversation. Pam is the author of How Much of These Hills is Gold, winner of the Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Award, and the Asian Pacific Award for Literature, nominated for the Booker Prize, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award, Hemingway Award and the National Book, Critics Circle, National Book Critics John Leonard Prize, and of course, Barack, one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year. Zhang's writing has also appeared in Best American Short Stories, The Cut, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and others. So without any further delay, please join me in giving Sarah and Pam a very, very warm welcome. <laughs> Very special being here and seeing so many faces that I know and love. It's been a lifelong dream to be in this room. Um, I'm going to do a short little reading and um, then we'll get on with it. I'm going to read the first chapter of the novel. All this could be different. A1. I would like to tell a story of a different time. I was 22, a teak switch of a girl. I had finished college. There were not many jobs. The economy had punctured like a tire. Obama had won a second term. He said, jobs, healthcare, national healing. He said, Trayvon Martin could have been my son. I was moved by this, thought that sort of imaginative exercise bravery I would listen to his speeches on NPR as I dressed for work. I had found a job. This set me apart from my college friends. I was a consultant, or going to be, this despite my arty degree. A consultant in training, three toddlers hiding in a soup. I did not consider myself a sellout. What I felt was that I had been saved from drowning 
My classmates without jobs had moved in with their parents, were working unpaid internships at noble nonprofits. I wished them well. My parents were not with me, had left me to make my way in the new country. I was glad they did not, for now, need me to send them money they had before. My client was a baobab of a corporation, Fortune 500. They made car seats, heating units, pedometers, batteries. My boss demanded I wear pantyhose. You are a contractor, he told me. No benefits. Women who work for me wear makeup, that is how it is. My men wear suits. You must dress better than the clients always. That is how they know we work for them. We get the client to the definition of success. People only want to hire a guy when they want to be him a little. Remember that. Try some makeup, just a little, nothing tardy. I listened dutifully. The pay was only okay. Billable contractors' wages, this despite the 50 hour weeks. I had to file self-employment self taxes. But my boss liked me. Early on, he called me his rock star. This was funny to me, since in actuality, rock stars get on stage, perform, fuck many girls, wreck the hotel room. I, meanwhile, sweated competence, a hungry efficiency, waxed my arms, radiated deference, never met a Gantt chart I didn't like. He had first offered me $19 an hour. His firm was tiny, only nine people. I said, thank you, I will think on it. I walked to a good restaurant in my college town and drank a full glass of white wine in the middle of the afternoon. I called him back. I said, hello, Peter. I have another offer, but I want to work with you. Would you consider 30? In the space between the gin bottles, the mirrored bar showed me a soft featured girl, skin the color of Hennessy, eyes, eyes vacant with fear. My boss said, like a god granting a boon, 23 an hour, you will relocate to Milwaukee where your client is. I will pay for your apartment. That sounds great, I said, may have added. I'm honored I get to work for you. All nonsense. Once I hung up, I punched the air and yelled. I remember the restaurant as deserted, but it may not have been. This is not a story about work or precarity. I'm trying late in the evening to say something about love, which for many of us is not separable from the other shit. As the summer began, I moved to Milwaukee, a rusted city where I had nobody, parents two oceans away. I lay on the sun-warmed wood floor of my paid-for apartment and decided I would be a slut. <laughs> Thank you. You know, for all of you who have not had the chance to read this book yet, I had the privilege of reading it, I think maybe a year or more ago in its more infant state. And when I got my finished copy, I just distinctly remember how magical the voice of this book felt. The first time and the second time, I think that for many of us, it's a rare experience to read a book in which it grabs you just as much or perhaps even more the second time around because there's something just really alive and vital. And I think one of the things that really impressed me about the book, which we got a slice of here, is that it has this incredibly wide emotional range, right? Like I, there are books I love that just make you sob the whole way or books that are completely satire and this somehow manages to do all of it. It's funny, it's smart, it's dumb. <laughs> I think I'm allowed to say that. Um, it's, you know, cause it's not afraid of um, sort of the dumbness of being a human as well, right? And I just, I kind of wanted to ask, how did you do that? How did you um, achieve that sort of breadth of tone? And was that intentional at the beginning? That is incredibly generous. Um, as some of you know, um, before I wrote this book, which um, I wrote the majority of a sort of complete workable draft where it became itself in 2020 in, you know, about five months when I was, um, you know, hiding out from COVID and 
organizing with some of the people who are in this room and um, trying desperately to see if I had what it took um, was how I, I, I put it to myself um, when it came to writing. Um, I approach this project with a certain kind of mix, like a particular emulsion of desperation and confidence that I think could not have happened at another time in my life. Um, the desperation came from having worked on a previous project for almost seven years um, and then finally saying I don't have what it takes to make this work the way I want to and setting that project aside. Um, and so I felt, I think, the deep vulnerability of wondering if I'd made the right choices with my life when it came to trying to pursue art. But the other thing that happened in 2020 was I felt the world change all around me in ways that confirmed some of my deepest beliefs that people can care for each other that we can build new structures where others have failed. And all of a sudden, I just tapped into this feeling of certainty. And I think that that confidence lives in the book and in the tone of the writing. I think the other thing I'll say is, I, I think sometimes you, just, sometimes you just happen upon your main character and they reveal themselves to you. And I really, saw Sneha, the book's protagonist, really clearly. I felt like I understood her, I cared for her. I wanted a book that could seduce its reader, first through withholding. When you read, when you read the opening pages of All This Could Be Different, Sneha's voice is clipped, it holds back. She's a pretty emotionally withholding person. And as you relax into the book, she opens up more and more, not just to the other characters, but to the reader. And yeah, I mean, finally, life is complex and textured and, you know, it's full of ups and downs and indignity and exaltation and humor. And I wanted to try to capture some of that because it reflected my life at the moment. I think you did that. <laughs> You talked about community just now, and I want to discuss that topic a little more. Um, I think community is a theme in this book, and also it's sort of a formal decision as well. Um, just, I mean, writers will always want to talk their heads off about craft. I won't force us to do that right now, but I mean, this book is split into first four sections. The first, I think, is called I, and the last is called Us. And so I love that you can see the book formally moving through those stages that you described. And another thing that I noticed that was like really interesting and unusual is that this is a book that simultaneously has a really strong main character. Like you get to know Seha like in and out all the way through. And at the same time, it has a huge cast of characters. Um, every sort of, in what other books I think would be called secondary characters, don't feel secondary at all. They all feel extremely whole. Um, extremely real and I just wanted to ask you about how you sort of created that sense of community in the book and sort of formally what were you doing? What a lovely question. Community is something we have heard more and more about um, in the mainstream I think particularly after COVID and many of the current events of the last couple of years. I think it's useful sometimes to work with definitions because people mean very different things when they talk about community. The definition of community that I have held close to my heart the most in the last few years um, is, I think, M. Scott Pex. And he defines community as a group of people who rejoice together, mourn together, and have made some kind of commitment to make each other's conditions their own. Um, and this was my life in the last few years in a way that I'm so deeply blessed for and it felt extremely profoundly part of my life in 2020 when um, 
I helped found and again organized with some of the people who are in this room um, a mutual aid network in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And so I wanted to find a way that worked for me as an artist and a writer to work within the beloved, frustrating, somewhat conservative at its heart form of the novel, which in so many ways was first and best created to tell the story of an individual self. And I found myself thinking, well, can I do that while charting a journey from, uh, from an I to a we? Which is, I would argue, what this novel tries to do. You start off with this one character who, among other things, really never hopes for anything for herself besides the assurance of a certain kind of like individuate, individuated safety. You know, what she wants is to, you know, not be at the bottom of a professional pecking order at some point. She wants maybe to own an apartment someday and not be at the mercy of, you know, landlords and capital and all the rest of it. But like she is someone who conceives of herself as an atom floating in to the world by herself. And she's also very young. She's 22. Um, I wrote this book at the end of my 20s, and it really emphasized for me how young 22 can be. Some of you may know. Um, and so I wanted to work within the genre of the coming-of-age novel and use it to show a self-formed, not through someone hauling ass to the world by themselves or bootstrapping, but a self-formed through other people, a self-formed through deep friendships, that can change you and challenge you and push against you. I, yeah, I felt all that. I think it is a kind of quietly revolutionary in it, its craft, um, which should be discussed more. Um, what you just said about a person form through friendships, I definitely felt that. There were things where I don't, I guess I wouldn't go so far as to say stay has friends. Um, make her into someone, but they help her clarify somebody that she was starting to become and perhaps speed that process up. And a really interesting quality to the friendships in this book is there are a lot of fights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, not physical. Okay, there's one that's kind of physical. Um, but there are a lot of fights in this book between friends. Um, and I just, I'm just really curious to hear what you think about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are many sort of possible responses to that. So what I that come to mind. So I guess what I'll say is we learn things like we like the conflict bestows a wealth of data upon us. Um, there are there's a wealth of novels out in the world where that take their like form, subject, entire journey um, from the you know sort of subject matter of romantic conflict. The will they, won't they, between two people in love, what have you. Um, and I think at the end of the day, my whole life, I have been a huge, dumb, sappy romantic about friendship. Friendship for me is the one of the most essential relational units there is. There's something very beautiful about it for me. I think at its best, there's something quietly politically radical about about friendship as a form and a relational unit and it really matters to me to see it taken seriously um, it really matters to me to see works in the broader culture that take friendship seriously and one way to take something seriously is depicted um, in rainbow and pastel colors and say here's this beautiful thing to take it as a subject. But I also think there's another way, there's an additional layer to taking something seriously, which is to show, to show conflict at its heart, to show what happens when things go wrong. Um, and the reality is we're not called, like, the reality is from when I was 13 years old, like 13 years old onwards and like reading Cosmo when my mom was getting her hair cut, I was fed 
so much advice about how to please a romantic partner, resolve a conflict with a romantic partner, a man, um, usually. But um, I received so much, like such a paucity of information, like so little information about how to be a good friend, how to show up for people, how to resolve hurt or betrayal within friendship. And so I thought, let me try to do my little part. Yeah, and there's definitely a sense in this book where the friendships that do survive these fights are deeper. There is a greater emotional intimacy to them. Um, there's an interesting line in which that is spoken by Tig, who is a friend of Sneha's who, um, they start out like going on a date, right? So there was like a sort of flicker of romantic possibility at the beginning that doesn't pan out, but there's a moment in the book later in which Sneha is sort of reconsidering just, just that invitation of a romantic possibility, and she declines it because she says, or Tig, sorry, she says, okay, sorry, Sneha says, as a friend, I was my better self. Um, just moving from this discussion of friendship to one of romantic relationships, how does Sneha conceive those, t those two kinds of worlds? That's a really good question. I think for many reasons, Sneha is somebody who doesn't dream very big or much for herself, and that includes romantically. Um, Sneha is a queer woman. She's an immigrant who comes from an incredibly conservative background, um, and you know, has a family that dreams a very particular dream for her, which is a certain degree of respectability and success um, and eventually you know she references it multiple times through the novel the arranged marriage with the paid for man um, and so you know this young person has really formulated this narrative for herself around her own coming of age which is I have this window of time the ticking clock of my youth where I get to not be married, not be tied down, and I'm going to work this job, make my money, and have a whole lot of sex. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's this real um, arithmetic clarity to how she approaches this time in her life, where she's, you know, you heard me read at the end of the, you know, at the end of the first chapter, she's like, I decided I'm going to be a slut. And it, ha it has everything to do with um, her feeling this sense of being, yeah, like led to the gallows a little bit um, at some point in time, you know, and her parents finding some, you know, nice, nice boy from the motherland that she does not expect to love. Um, and so I think that the way desire functions in this novel is really the source of like really the source of like embodiment for her. You get to see you you get to see her wanting. Um, you get to learn this other side of the eager office drone. And you get to like Sneha's, you know, when it com when it comes to the sex scenes in this book, they're very frank, they're lucid, they don't cut away to darkness. I really believe that whenever possible it's good to write against shame. And I grew up in a cultural context where a lot of things, including sex, were really saturated with shame. Um, and I wanted to push against that. And I wanted to show the sort of profound and intimate and data-filled communication that happens between two people when they take their clothes off and let their desires be known to each other. Yeah, I think that sex is one of the ways in the book in which we start to see that Sneha that we that you talk about at the end of the book coming through, right? She is so buttoned up at the beginning, I mean, literally buttoned up going to her work. And I think the first sex scene in the book is both powerful and lovely and surprising because you're like, whoa, this was inside this girl. Um, and I love that about about the novel. There's, there's a way in which, um, as I was reading this, it made me feel that sometimes in the book, sex was the most honest place for Sneha, and honest in both a beautiful way and honest in sometimes an ugly way, right? Where she's working through like 
sexual kinks she's working through, sort of, um, you know, gender roles that she's learned from society. There's something, there's this interesting moment, and I think where she, I think she's talking about how she learned about how to see women sexually mm -hmm. from men, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yeah, what do you, just what do you think of that? It's like, it's such a complicated... It is really complicated. It is really complicated. Let me see if I can, in a second, find something, um, like find a short passage that I think um, will enable me to sort of make the argument that I'm going to make. Um, so the scene happens at a party, um, and, uh, and Sneha is having a moment with her, with her bro, Tom, who is one of the two important friendships in this novel. Um, and they're out smoking in the garden, and she's very drunk, which I think allows her to get past her essential avoidance and say something real to her friend. So the context is Tom has just asked if she's into Tig. And she says, I really like Tig. I said, in much the same way I really like you. Desire does not feature prominently. At this, Tom pressed his lips together very slightly. He nodded, flicked ash onto an iced out flower bed. I was very drunk. My head felt as though it were filled with oil in the cold night. With everything else blurred, I could feel more clearly the shape of the thing circling the dark drain of who I was. I'm afraid, I said slowly, the words stilted and ungainly as they left my throat, that I'm not very well constructed to be with anyone. For me, there was only Amit, and that was a disaster. Friendship I can navigate, though there are still things that there that feel like too much. I can like pull, you know, like get someone home. Sometimes after I sleep with someone, all I feel is contempt. Sometimes I feel like contempt while things are happening, like I hate the person, like I'm thinking like sexist things, like the words dumb bitch will flash through my mind while I'm doing shit to someone. I feel like being a little cruel makes me better at sex with women, something about wanting to bring a person to their knees. But then it's over and I can't bear the sight of them. I'm afraid maybe of being with someone I also really like, because then if, what, then if, what if I'm ugly to that someone? Like, I don't know, I've never been in love. I don't have it in me too, I think sometimes. That's what I feel when I see you and Isabel. This is what I won't have. As you read the novel, you move through an underst and move through an understanding and also different phases of understanding of who this young person is, and um, in particular, a painful secret from her youth that she holds close. Um, and I really agree with you about sex as this zone of honesty. I think that it really mattered to me to write something that, as I said, did not show an ounce as much as possible of shame or shying away from the like frank facts of the body and the queer body and the queer body having sex, but also alongside desire held the pain and the facts of all the rest of life, you know? And you sort of, you see that, I think, particularly in the sex scenes, you see the choreography and choices this person is making at, their, at a moment of her deepest hunger um, to hide things, to transpute some of her past pain into moments of desire that allow her, frankly, I think at, at its best, like transcendence. You might even say she's very naked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, one of the things that I saw coming through Seha's psych uh, psyche in these sex scenes was also family. I don't know if, um, I'm sure you did this on purpose, but there are some really beautiful moments in sex in the sex scenes in which, so Sneha, you know, grew up in India, or for part of her childhood was in India, um, and in a lot of, and it's a part of her life that she tries to, like, keep to the side, to compartmentalize, but oftentimes in the sex scenes, there would be these really beautiful moments where something about the act, some texture, some smell reminds her of a tree, 
in her family home or food that she ate growing up. Um, and I just, yeah, I wanted to ask you too about that. Yeah, I suppose general, generally about compartmentalization in this character who has like sort of very distinct zones in her life and also about family. That's a hell of a question. Um, I think what I'll say is, yeah, I mean, you read it absolutely correct in my eyes, right? Like this is someone who so desperately builds these little compartments. Um, and she's like, this is A, this is B, you know, it's as neatly ordered as an Excel spreadsheet, the different zones of her life. She doesn't want anything to touch. She really fears a certain kind of loss of control. But there's almost no way, in my opinion, to fully have control in an act of intimacy that involves a person other than yourself. You can, you know, be be home and whacking it, and then like I'm sure you have, you know, f like much much more control than you than you would. Uh, sorry, what? Um, than you would, um, you know, if you choose to involve anybody else. And so you see the the borders blur a little bit. Um, you see, you know, there's a there's a line um, that references the. Um, Carolite dessert of Piasum, um, you know, which I will let let readers find for themselves. So yeah, I think that there's a blurring that matters, and I also think I went back and forth about some of those things because I felt a degree of self consciousness um, after I wrote some of those lines, and then wondered should I keep this in. And then I thought, you know, the reality is, and other writers, writers like Amitabha Kumar, for example, or Sanjana, Sanjana Satyan have talked about the ways in which South Asians are, like, can often be seen in the larger culture as some, somewhat sexually neutered. And so I was just like, you know what? We are full beings, and that includes desire, and it deserves to go in. It definitely does. I'm glad you kept it in. Um, I want to talk about something fun, which is that this book, in, a, in addition to many things, has really incredible food descriptions. Um, there's a lot of food people are eating. Um, sometimes eating is like an act of class. Sometimes eating is an act of liberation. How does food function in the book for you? When... I worked on the earlier project I mentioned, there was very little food descriptions at all. Um, and um, one reason why was there is this sort of, stereotype isn't right, the right word, but there's this trope of the exotic ingredients that like, the, and dishes that like feature in the South Asian novel. like like other and smarter writers than me have talked about, you know, the, the, man the mangoes in the novel or the curry novels. Um, and so food can feature as this, you know, agent of delight because it's always fucking fun in my eyes to like read about delicious food um, and sensory pleasure in general. But it also can feature as a sort of a agent of othering, you know, that we where the food characters eat in South Asian novels can sort of serve to exoticize um, the, the characters eating it. And so I just thought about my own relationship with food through my life, you know, what and all the different permutations of it, what it means to have someone cook for you and care for you, what it means to, when you're really fucking depressed, like drag yourself out of bed and make a like a depression dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about what it meant when I first took myself or somebody else out to like a bougie ass meal at like a new American restaurant when all of them did, like farm to table was all, like first, first, you know, coming, coming into its own. Um, and I thought of the times in my life when the times in my life that have felt the most precarious and unstable. Um, in ways that affected the food on my plate. And I thought, here is one vehicle for honesty and texture and a way to make manifest class and politics and striving and hunger. And so I was like, it goes in. So food is really used in many ways to chart Sneha's, I would argue, false ascent and then her descent and then her 
future. By the way, my favorite food scene is when she's eating chickpeas off her chest and lying in bed, which I think we've all done. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, like my, like, you know, my feminism, which is imperfect, is the, is dirtbag feminism. So <laughs> it's, it, it had to be in there. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, now I'm going to move to questions from our lovely audience. First one, when you were writing the book, who was your imagined reader? Now that it's out, what do you hope your reader gets from it? Lovely question. I wrote this book first and hardest for my younger self, who I saw, like, who, when I was that younger self, I felt so tough and grown and impervious, and I looked back again at the end of my 20s and I was like oh my god you poor baby um, um, and so I think I wrote it first and hardest for my younger self for my sister for the people I love most many of whom are in this room I wrote it for queer people South Asian people immigrants and the people who I know many of whom I know and love who are working and striving and struggling in the hope that at some point we will live to see a better fucking world. I think that constellation of people was what kept me writing like a maniac, you know, during the time that I worked on this book. What are you most proud of yourself for throughout this process? <laughs> This is an act of violence. <laughs> on this question, good job. Keep asking this question at every literary event you go to. I'm proud that I gave up and tried something new. I'm glad. I think that we, and certainly I, like, valorize a certain kind of dogged striving, like, a way to pull success out of the jaws of failure so much, and it's what kept me working on the project I was working on for almost seven years. I'm proud of accepting my failure and moving on and finding something new and letting, letting good things into my life. Um, this one says, hi, Sarah, fellow Malayali here. How do you think your culture and upbringing shaped your story and how you wrote your main character, Seha? Hey, I love this question. Hi. What's your name? Diana. Nice to meet you. I am really fucking proud of being from Kerala, being a Malayali. I, growing up, I identified with being a Malayali far more than I did with being an Indian. I think that there is a rich history of communitarian thinking, of political revolutionary activism. Kerala was the first place in the world to democratically elect a communist government. Um, it made you know, waves in 2020 with its success at caring for, um, caring for its citizens, you know, through providing food, providing medicine. And so, yeah, I, I would say the primary way um, I feel shaped by, by that part of my cultural heritage when it comes to writing is um, this comparative knowledge of how life can be lived. I also think that Kerala has like a really rich and Kerala and Malayalis have a really rich cultural, like literary history. It means something to me to be part of that lineage, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, pride is is the short answer. I think I'm gonna do one more. Okay. And how has your work as an organizer influenced your writing, and vice versa? I'm still figuring out the answer um, to this question. But what I will say is.
they're incredibly different in so many ways. I think that one of the lessons of a certain kind of maturity as an artist was accepting that there were things that fiction is good for and there are things that fiction is not fucking good for. Um, you know, this, this is a novel. It's not a manifesto or a zine or a tract. It's a novel. And there are things it does well and there are things it just does not try to do. But at the heart of it, what unites my organizing and my writing lives is the belief that people matter very much. That every single person is a unit, however finite, a unit of power and can be used in cohesion with other units of power to do a variety of things. I conceptualize people, I guess, as these wounded but also glorious sites of possibility. And in my artistic life and in my organizing life, I'm always interested in the art of what's possible. Thank you for imparting that wisdom on us. Well, Wait, can I say one last thing? Um, I've shared a little bit about my 2020 where lots of things happened, but some things didn't get to happen for me. I never got to sit in a bookstore with my friend Pam and hear her read or from her gorgeous debut novel. And, you know, I feel a little bit cheated by the universe. And I just want to say, for those of you who are not, who have not been lucky enough to read How Much of These Hills is Gold, Pam's debut novel, that it is one of the most remarkable books. I'm so sorry I'm doing this, I know you're embarrassed. <laughs> just, just, you know, like, like black, you know, black out if you need to. Um, but I, like, I'm really bad at being fake about so many things, so I am being really genuine right now. It is one of the most remarkable books I have read. It is this incredible novel that works within the genre of the Western, like I tore through it, but it's also legit literature. You will be you will be hearing about this book in 30 years, which is not something that can be said for every single book that gets published. So I hope that you, if you haven't yet, make the time to read this book, which is great. <laughs> Yeah, I was literally about to say the same thing, but you did a brilliant job bookselling that for me. Um, we do have copies available of How Much of These Hills is Gold available tonight, and maybe if you're nice enough, Pam might sign them for you. Um, otherwise, Sarah will be personalizing books at the desk behind us. We ask that you give her a moment to get settled, but then please do make your way downstairs so that our event staff can start to rearrange the space. If you're still with us online, we'd love for you to buy a copy of All This Could Be Different using the link in the live stream description. I think that's all. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Pam. Let's give them both a <laughs>